Hello, listeners, and welcome to the 10th episode of the Mad Scientist Roundtable. Giant squid! Giant squid! It's finally happened, Marie. We're finally talking about the giant squid together on a podcast. Pretty fascinating. Damn it, man. I've been waiting for some time to have a venue, a public venue, where I get to talk about the giant squid. People, you know what? People on public transit, what they don't want to, what they don't want to hear about? Giant squid. <laughs> is that what they? Is that what they've been telling you on the bus and train and stuff? Excuse me, ma'am. Pretty rough. Can you? Can you please let me? Can you please let me leave? And I'm like, no. I have to tell you about about this menace. But it's a threat. It's a real threat, ma'am. This threat. Oh my goodness. Do you know that they're real? And they're like pushing the button to stop. Um, I need to go. I need to go now. <laughs> so this episode, uh, this is actually really funny. We we really have been talking about this topic. Like I said in my in the full episode, I said that when I first contacted you to be on the show. You were yep. like, we got to do the giant squid. One caveat. Yes. Yeah, you were like, one we caveat. have to do the giant squid. And that was really one of the first, that was probably one of the first episodes that we like, ser- like really dug super deep into on, um, for the arc, right? Yes. It was the Mary Celeste episode yes. about the squid and everything. Um, which is pretty <laughs> which awesome. Team giant squid. Team giant squid. Which yeah. or, or t- I am so Still not, I'm still not ruling it out. Still not ruling it out. That, Fascinating. I know that they, th- I know that they think, yeah, no, nope. Still not ruling it out. Still not ruling it out. So this versus team, what was it? Team concussive. Team um, team sen- concurrent. It was team sensible cousins. of concussive blasts. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so sensible. here's the thing. This episode is gonna be really awesome. I'm pretty excited about it. But we have some intro stuff to get to as per usual. Yes. Um, one of the really cool intro things that we have to do this episode is we are working, Marie and I, on an offshoot, like kind of another sort of roundtable style thing, I guess, but a lot more focused, um, all still within the Mad Scientist header, and yes. we are going to call it Mad Science Presents. And yes. what these will be are we will be looking at uh, famous or not yet famous cases of uh, crimes or true crime stuff, whatever, like history of crime kind of stuff, because we feel like we could do it in a really interesting way with a lot of science. Yes, and a lot of research. Let me try, let me try introducing that again. That sounded really weird. (laughs) Is it, no, okay, really quick, is it Mad Scientist or Mad Science? Mad Scientist Presents, I guess, is better. Mad Scientist Presents. The, mad, si- the uh, mad scientist presents. Okay. All right. We'll do that. Okay. Ready? Okay. I'm not doing anything else. I'm not changing it. Okay. Okay. I'm ready. All right. So one really cool thing that we have to talk about this week that we're planning on starting pretty soon. I think we're going to try writing and recording the first episode uh, within the month is we yes. are working on a long kind of serial type series on um criminal and kind of like mystery things, right? So things that wouldn't necessarily be under the umbrella of the Mad Scientist podcast or the roundtables where we talk about kind of spooky sciencey stuff, but still yes, more ad hoc. Right. More fun stuff. <laughs> right. Yeah. We're, we're going to be uh, turning our investigative lenses and our kind of scientific mindset and interesting takes on things, hopefully interesting takes on things um, into the world of true crime, because we just feel that there's a lot of, there's a lot of really interesting questions and a lot of interesting stories that we think you would enjoy hearing about. And we think that with our varied backgrounds and just our, I don't know, we just feel like love, we can do it really well. minutia and detail, compulsive behavior to <laughs> dig into every single thing. <laughs> right. It, we might as well put it to some good use or at least to some use and, uh, and be digging into some, some cold cases some long-standing mysteries and some things of just a uh, general interest that, like uh, Chris was saying, that just don't normally come under our our header of what we've been doing so far. Absolutely, and so um, this will not affect the normal, like standard Mad Scientist show at all. It'll be. No, we'll still be ranting like crazy people. Yeah, no, on don't a even normal schedule. Yeah, don't even worry about it. Just consider <sighs> this like another bonus style of episodes that will be coming out for you, our wonderful listeners. Um, and so what we're going to be calling this is the Mad Scientist Presents. And bum, bum, bum. Bum, bum, bum. And so what we're thinking yes. is the first episode we are going to do on the mystery of Elisa Lamb. 
Yes. Which is pretty crazy if you haven't heard about it yet. Um, and yeah, we have some really cool stuff we think we're going we're gonna to be talking about on that one. And then, you know, any other stories you want us to cover, please let us know and we'd love to do them. Perfect. All right, Marie, let's get into some tentacle problems. Woo! Some scary ass fucking squid stuff. First of all, I, I just. <laughs> that was an awesome wrestling thank voice, you. by the way. That was good. I just have to thank you for finally, even though it's taken like 10 episodes, to finally rolling around to the giant squid. <laughs> I don't know, like, I don't know where this affinity for this uh this creature has come from but i know that like i'm not alone in it i know that people that i talk to that like uh any kind of marine biology crossing over with any sort of cryptozoology study or anything of the unknown have this have this weird affection and fear of a true life monster it is a real thing and it is I would classify it as a monster. Anything that you're going to call giant or colossal in my book, it's monster. It's a monster. Oh, hell yeah. It's like, well, we're, let, let's let's get into all of that, Marie. This is going to be great. Yes. All right. Welcome to the Mad Scientist Roundtable, episode 10, Double the Squid, Double the Suction. Giant squid, I love you, giant. Okay, sorry. So, if I step back and I say, "All right, why am I, why am I so entranced?" Even before uh, Astonishing Legends and the research we did for for them then on the Mary Celeste about giant squids, I think I have to kind of wrap my head around like when was the first time that I saw them or that I was really scared of them or that I that I was influenced by them because they're pretty squids and giant squids and sort of the myth of giant squids are, are pretty permanent in in our pop culture like like uh, Chris was saying 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea the Disney version so when you're young you inevitably will see um, Kirk Douglas standing on the on the deck of the uh of uh, the, uh, what's the ship called? Oh my God. The famous <laughs> ship, you know, with an ax hacking at, hacking at the uh, tentacles as the thing tries to attack him. Oh. But for me, the Nautilus, oh God. Yes, there the we Nautilus, go. standing on the bridge of the Nautilus with his ax and you damn dirty apes. No, wait, that's the wrong movie. But you know what <laughs> I'm getting at. Um, for me, I would say what really gelled my fear of the giant squid was one, I visited New York City, and I went to the um, the Natural History American Natural History Museum, and I um, like and it, actually a movie came out with the same title. Saw an exhibit in the in in I can't remember even what's I, I want to say it's the Mill Helen Hall the Mel, Millen Hall, and if you go um, oh the Milston Family Hall of Ocean Life yeah it's right. Yeah. So you walk in and you're already, you know, this museum is so overwhelming and so amazing and has so much to offer. And then you walk into this ginormous room and it's got the ginormous blue well hanging over and it's all kind of like this low lighting, but still really, you can make out stuff very clearly and you're walking around and you're looking at stuff. And then in the back corner, it's really, really dark. And there's not a lot of people hanging around back there looking at stuff. And so you're like, well, what's back there? And then you walk back a little further and you see that there's, there is an exhibit, but it's not behind glass. And so if you've been to any kind of natural, you know, natural science or natural history museum, you'll go and you'll see the exhibit of the cheetahs hunting down the zebra. And it's all behind glass and it's very well lit. And, you know, it's very, it's, you're looking at it and you're like, oh, yeah, this, yeah, this sucks to be the zebra. But you don't really, you know, it doesn't really elicit anything besides, oh, okay, check that box. Let's go see the walruses. But you're, you're going back there and there's no, there's, it's dark, but there's something there, but there's no glass. And then you get closer and all of a sudden it comes into focus and it's a uh, sperm whale being attacked by a giant squid in real size. Yeah. And it is just like, the creepiest fucking it's, thing on the face of the planet. It's fucking terrifying. Like it's really it was terrifying. really it was really crazy. Like I so I um I didn't know that you had 
I didn't know you were going to talk about this. And I, until yeah. like we got on the, until like we got on the phone today, right? Or whatever mm-hmm. on this. Mm-hmm. And so when you, um, when you said it, right? That like that, right? I was like, oh my God, I know exactly what she's fucking talking about because it is one of the, it, okay, this is going to sound super, uh, super lame. One of my <laughs> greatest fears, Marie, mm-hmm. are, uh, whales in the ocean. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So like, so not okay. Not like I don't mean like a whale. Like if I saw a whale at like a museum, I wouldn't be scared necessarily, right? Or like an aquarium. Mm-hmm. But I mean like that. Okay, you're in you're in the ocean, and it's dark, and you can't see Rice. more than a hundred feet in front of you. If and, that, yes. And exactly. all of a sudden, you hear. A, a, a deep groan yeah, and you feel the pressure hitting yes. your face as the water starts to be displaced by this giant fucking thing and all of a sudden out of the mist, out of the murky depth comes a 300 ton whatever whatever weight a blue whale is krill eating motherfucker man i'll right? tell you right now a, yeah. a huge a, just a huge right 300,000 pound adult blue whale right um just comes it's- out of the ocean and and like you know you're not even a speck of dust to this thing no right I, it's yes. oh god it's one of the i have that i have that nightmare that's one of my most common nightmare cliches, Marie, is being in the ocean. No, I'm and being taking like, notes. I'm taking notes. Shit. <laughs> like, <laughs> and honestly, I think part of it comes from that fucking exhibit because not only so is. not only is it not only is it um, not behind glass, which make gives you the feeling of like, oh my god, I could fall in, or it could come out, or it could come is out. What I was thinking too, but like, it's, it's the way it's lit makes it seem like the ocean. It's yes. it's honestly it's like the blue whale exhibit up top the giant blue whale sculpture is worth it but that one corner makes the natural history museum for me worth it every time. And it's it is it's like this dark kind of and they we're it's gonna, all on purpose so it's it's the natural environment and what basically it is if you're if the viewers have not seen it would like to imagine it in their head it's <laughs> The snout, so the head of the blue whale is what's... It's either a blue whale it's or... It's a sperm whale. whale. It's a sperm whale. Sperm whale, and it's it's rearing up, right? And it, the mouth is open, and so it's it's full size, or as close to full size as you can it's, fit. I mean, it's huge. it's huge. It's huge. It's huge. Yeah. And then from around the top is a giant squid, like wrapping itself around the whale and getting it in its tentacles or in its mouth. So it's impossible to see if who's winning. Yeah. By the time you like focus on it and look at it and it it dawns on you what it is, you're sort of like, I remember the first time I saw it and every single time, like I end up just stepping back because I'm like, oh, holy shit. You know, that's like, because you're just like, well, there's no glass. Are they putting something in? What is this? And then it is just like, it comes into focus and it's, it's this, it is this weird response that I think is something that they talk about. Um, it was talked about in more in Victorian times with, uh, especially when Jules Verne wrote 20,000 yeah. Leagues, which is the idea of the sublime, right? The sublime is something that inspires, and I'm paraphrasing terribly, but it inspires both terror and beauty. So yeah. you see something, and it is something that is that is um, that is so um, not familiar to you again. But it, it is in such scale, in such magnitude that you're both like you're terrified of it, and it is a beautiful thing. And I think that that is that is uh, the the idea of the sublime is applied a lot to Jules Verne's writing and to Melville as well. Yeah. Which, Famously, you know, it had the same two characters in it. And in this exhibit, I feel like that's really one of the things that you automatically feel is this, like, I feel this, this wonder, like, oh my God, these things are real. This is a real, these are, these aren't make-believe monsters. These are real things that are under the sea and it's beautiful. And at the same time, this, this, this terror that they're just going to come out of that exhibit. There's no glass. (laughs) 
there's nothing keeping them there. And that's what's so that's what's so vivid about it for me. And I think that that's one of the things that just repeatedly again and again is so scary about a squid. And it's just so I think squid is so alien looking. It's so different than you know, it, it has no features that we can that we can anthropomorphize, right? Or that we can make look human. Yeah, to it's, us, it's 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 crazy looking. I think I think a big part of it. So so first off, uh, mm-hmm. you touched on a bunch of things that I think are really interesting that we're gonna have to get into here. Uh, first off, for listeners, if you want to see, mm-hmm. so we're gonna put uh, up on the show notes. We're gonna put a, a blog post by the Natural History Museum discussing the, the panorama and the giant squid bodies that they actually have there. And we'll also put a picture of it up on the website. So if you want to check that out, please do. It's going to be pretty scary. Yes. <laughs> it does, it we, does, won't, we won't be able to sleep for weeks, but by no, all means, it go doesn't, check it out. It like, doesn't do it justice, but no. it's pr- like that, that fucking squid thing is really scary. Like <laughs> with looking at that picture, I got chills. I was like, oh, God. Um, I, I think there's the, a... Who's the creepy-ass m uh curator who was like, hey, guys, I have an idea. Like, they're just like <laughs> bad acid or something, and they're sitting around, they're like, you know, memberships fall in, you know, yeah, everybody's seen the whale, yeah, great, the diamonds, the, the yeah. dinosaurs. I have a scary idea. It? Yeah, like, seriously. Yeah. And they're like, and then we don't light it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and there's no glass. So, th- so uh, <sighs> this episode, so, okay, this, this is really interesting. I think that idea about the sublime um, mm-hmm. This is a quote from 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. We're going to do a couple of 20,000 Under the Sea, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea quotes here tonight. Um, so this is a quote from that book. Quote, The sea is everything. It covers seven-tenths of the terrestrial globe. Its breath is pure and life-giving. It is an immense desert place where man is never lonely, for he senses the weaving of creation on every hand. It is the physical embodiment of a supernatural existence, for the sea is itself nothing but love and emotion. It is the living infinite. As one of your poets has said, nature manifests itself in it. Sorry, nature manifests herself in it with her three kingdoms, mineral, vegetable, and animal. The ocean is the vast reservoir of nature, end quote. The, so the interesting thing, I think, is this idea of the sea being, like you said, it's, it's so familiar to us, right? Mm-hmm. But it's mm-hmm. so alien, and it's not alien mm-hmm. like... It's alien outside of anything else. Like, if we... Okay, we go to a distant planet or something, um, you can still move on a distant... Like, you're still walking, right? Yes. You're still walking. You um, are not at a disadvantage in the same sense that if you're in the ocean, you're at a disadvantage where um, you can't move. There's no source of oxygen. There's... Um, you know, I mean, obviously that's sort there's of oxygen nothing thing. around you. Right. You're like, open from all sides. Yeah, yeah. there's absolutely. And, and that's that feeling of like, I think that's that feeling that makes it so scary for me is this idea of literally on all sides of you is danger in the ocean. Yeah. Right. So like, yeah. there's nothing, there's nothing you can do in the damn ocean, man. <laughs> so damn ocean. And I think, I think you're right about this idea that the squid is... In the same way with the with a whale or with any large mm-hmm. animal, it's like they're they're so alien to us, you know. At least like if you know uh, ele- an elephant, elephants are the largest land mammals, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Largest land animals, I should say. Um, and they're they're not nearly as terrifying to people, I would say, as like a like a giant squid or right. Like, um, yeah. And I think it's the idea that. The elephant, at least, we think we have some kind of kinship with. You can, you can yes. almost reason with an elephant because you think, yes. well, they have, they have love and they have right. Yes. And so, in that exactly. sense, it's they, they too can feel fear, or they have the similar set of emotions, or right? Whatever it is, right, you right. Can, again, yeah, and like, kinship. and we think like you know, okay, they have they have similar. They have a similar brain to us, and they have a similar body yes. structure, and they have a similar whatever. But squid are completely different. Like, they're 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 not as, you know, they're not, I don't even know how you'd quantify the most different something could be. But they're, you know, they're not at all like us. And yep. so to think that something that large could just right. be 
you know, to interact with something that different from you is intrinsically terrifying because you can never guess their motives or their emotions or whatever. It's, I think, a very similar type of fear to the fear of, like, an alien or something, right? Where Exactly, you have yeah. no idea. So, yeah. And so that, that, uh, that, that fear I was talking about before, um, about the ocean being terrifying, is, um, it's called thalassophobia, or thalasso- thalassophobia, sorry, thalassophobia. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, is an intense or persistent fear of the sea or sea travel. Pretty terrifying. Man, you could never have been a sea captain. No. Or even a first mate, or anything along those. You could never, you could never go on deadliest catch as the uh, as the Greenhorn. No, no, on, I couldn't. On the Epic or whatever the name of the ships are on the Northwestern, because you, besides throwing up the entire time and not knowing what you're doing, you'd be terrified. I'd be terrified. I'd be a big baby. Like I don't like you'd the thing is baby. the thing is like I don't have a problem being on top of the sea. Like on a boat, I'd be fine. I just could. I would be. I would be shit in my pants. I mean, it's a good thing it's the sea. They would never know. Um, <laughs> you know, fish do it. Whatever. That is. But, that's you know. That's that's the one positive side. The one positive. There we go. That's the one positive. The one positive they won't know there. if you shit yourself. There you go. <laughs> they won't know they like, because it's the sea. Because it's the sea. Who would know? And, then, and so uh, the the thing that's really fascinating too with the giant squid. We touched on this last time in the episode where we did like the history and the kind of the science more. Um, the other thing about the giant squid that keeps the story going, and I think this is true for a lot of cryptids or a lot of paranormal things as well, is the continued little tidbits of evidence. Yes. Right? Yes. The reason why we don't talk about a giant crab monster coming out of the ocean anymore is because we've never found a giant crab carcass on the shore of Newfoundland, right? Or Newfoundland. Nope. Oh, I butchered nope. that name, but like gonna hear it. Gonna hear it. From oh God, from Canada! Season. I'm gonna hear it. Oh, oh, my Canada. Canadian relatives are gonna be like, "What the hey. hell, man? What the hell is that?" But, but we have found like over time, and now we know that mm-hmm. they're actually real. Um, so all this discussion is moot, anyways. But like over time, we have found giant tentacles wash up on shore or in the bodies of sperm whales, or and the thing is too, we know that the sea can have ginormous creatures. Right? Yes. We've had... Inst- and that's... Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, like, we we have instances where... <laughs> I'm just giving myself the heebie-jeebies. <laughs> <that> still. <laughs> I mean, it's like... Oh. Oh. I, mean, the, I mean, just imagine, like, really quick to your point, you're, you're, a, uh, you're hunting whales, or you're, you're, um, you find a whale um, washed up on shore, and it has, like, scars of giant sucker marks on it. And you're sort of like, if you don't have any context to that, you're like, what the hell is this? Yeah. You know, what the, what the hell is this ginormous, as big as a dinner plate or a hubcap um, mark? And then you start seeing them again. And then you find like little bits and pieces that, you know, that add up to something much larger. I mean, to have that sort of, to be able to put that together and be like, oh, holy shit, it's this big and it's under the sea. And not to have seen the entirety of the thing is just like a whole different it's like it's science it's based in science and it's but it's still not it's still almost like supernatural in some yeah ways. and it's you and know it's, what i mean yeah it's, and it's a situation creepy. where it's a situation too where back then when they were hunting whales it would mm-hmm. take a whole ship of people to bring down one whale yes right yes and so now they're thinking oh my god there's something that there's a creature that's powerful enough and big enough to take down one of these things. Yes. Right. There's something like, as big that we've never seen. Right. Exactly. That's fighting with this. Exactly. I, it's it's terrifying, and the continued yeah. little bits of information just make it worse. You know what I mean? It's it'd be like you're a little kid, and your mom's like, "There's no monster," but every night you wake up to find monster hair, like on yeah. your bed. Oh, here's a here's a footprint. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, right, like and oh, you're like look. you're like uh, it shed its skin and here's a piece of it. Yeah, and you're like right. Yeah. It's like every time you think you've gotten a handle on it, you hear like breathing at night and scratching, and you're like shit. <laughs> All right, that let's, doesn't sound like that doesn't sound like spot. Let's get off of this topic before I pee my pants because I'm not in the sea right now, and so people will definitely know. <laughs> I'll know, and I will tell everyone. <laughs> You'll know especially, which will be very bad for me. All right.
So, one cool thing about the giant squid is because they are real, there is a lot of actual science to do with them. <sighs> There's just a lot of, like, real stuff going on, which is phenomenal. And so, and it's it's one of the few cases where, like, you know, pe- like the ancient aliens guys or um, people that are into, like, Bigfoot and stuff mm-hmm. always want to say, oh, oh, by the way, before I get into this too hard, um, Cryptid Crate came mm-hmm. in the mail for us, so for, for me, so I ordered a Cryptid, a cryptid Crate. Nice. Um, and it's fucking awesome. What's in it? Are we allowed like to a, ask? It came, it, it came, <gasps> oh yeah, of course God. you're allowed to ask. You can't even, I don't know I'm, I'm like, signing up for them now oh, for seriously? everything. Um, I didn't know if it was it like came a, came with a, like an NDA. It came with like a big, a Bigfoot, um, a Bigfoot field guide by Jeff Meldrum. Oh, shut up. Right? It came with a cool shirt on Bigfoot. It came with an awesome Bigfoot DVD, like a documentary. It came with a bunch of cool podcast stickers. Like, I'm super pumped about it. It's really good. I want one. For the price. So I, I, I highly suggest listeners, check out Cryptid Crate. The more of you that join, the better the crates can get for all of us already <laughs> subscribed. So it can only get better. Oh, man. Anyways. Now I want so, one. That's just what I, that's oh, just what I so, need to come into the house and having my husband be like, what the hell is this? And I'm like, it's a cryptid crate. And he'll be like, how much, oh what are you spending the money? And I'm like, Bigfoot stuff, honey? I, I know. Katie was like, Katie was like, something called cryptid crate came in the mail for you. <laughs> and I was like, oh, it's here. I got all Chris. excited. Yeah, I was like super pumped about it. Um, <laughs> just, yeah, just have it. Funny. You know what? Just have it delivered to work. Just have it delivered to work, man. That's what I do. That's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna hit the deluxe. I should just get it sent to the deluxe. Sent to work. And imagine how. Imagine your coworkers. They'll be like, "What the hell? What's the new guy? What's a cryptid?" And you'll be like, oh, "Sit down and let me tell you about it." And then they're gonna be like. <laughs> Did, is HR? Did you get? Did you get Beth from HR for this? Maybe we should get her. <laughs> should get HR's heads up on this guy. Um, all right. Anyways, so, so now here's the cool thing with giant squids, as yes. we were saying. Yes. Um, before oh, I was so rudely interrupted by my own brain. Giant squids. Oh. So, so giant squids are one of the few cases of a like a cryptozoological or a paranormal thing becoming true. Yes. Really? Right. So. Um, we always talk about, like, little victories, kind of, so, like, like, I don't know, I don't know why they point out the coelacanth is one example of this, because nobody was, like, on boats being, like, there's a, a fish that's, like, three feet long, that's, you know what I mean, like, the coelacanth is not, it's an awesome fish, and it's really cool how big it can get, and that it has been around since prehistoric times, but there's a difference between, um, like, that, that is, like, finding any species, you know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, it's like, just, of course we thought yeah. it. Of course we thought it was extinct at first, but we we always assume that of any animal that we find, um, like if we had found, if we had found an alligator bone, mm-hmm. right? Alligators have been around since prehistoric times as well. Mm-hmm. Or cro- I think it's alligators or crocodiles. I don't know if it's both, but certainly one of them has been around since that time period. If we had, if if alligators or crocodiles were more sparse. And we had found one of their bones beforehand. We would have assumed that it was a, uh, a prehistoric animal yes. at first. Yes, agreed. You know what I mean? So, so, but I like, and I, and I do understand. Of course, it is a huge thing. It's very interesting that it was deemed extinct and then it's come back, and or you know, they've we've now found evidence that it's alive again. And of course, you know, um, but that doesn't make it otherworldly. There's a difference. I think what you're getting at is yeah. Well, a that's difference that's always that, the difference right? between a crypto zo- like that's the difference though between a cryptozoological claim and a and a supernatural claim, yes. right? Like, like I would not be, I would be surprised and really excited if Bigfoot was found to be real. Yes, <laughs> but I would not be as blown out of the fucking water by it as if Bigfoot turned out to be a shape shifting monster man. Do you I'll know give you what I mean? Yes. Like, yes. Yeah. yes. Like if Bigfoot turns out to be a skinwalker, I'll sh- you know. Damn, I'll eat my hat. You know what I mean? Yes. If Bigfoot turns out to be like an escaped orangutan, I'll be like, oh, that, that makes, makes sense. more sense. Yeah. <laughs> so Mr. Bananas got out again. <laughs> you know? Like, Damn it, Mr. Bananas. It makes sense to me. Um, but so the thing, so the giant squid is one of those cases where, and again, it's not as monstrous as we thought, right? Right. It turns out they're they're pretty shy. They're really rare to find, as we would imagine. Yes. Um, they're. They're pretty. They're introverts. Like, they're, they're just introverts. Yeah, yeah. They're introverted, you know. Um, and they're not. 
they're not as aggressive or not, you know, so the stories of the Kraken mm-hmm. or the giant squid, you know, whatever, we're going to use those terms interchangeably, despite the historical stuff we went over last time. Yes. In those stories, it was like uh, an island would come up. You yes. know, you you would thought you were on land or something because of the size of this thing. And it would go after which, ships. It would actually right, like, and it would hunt. go after ships, yes. which brings up two questions. Number one, what kind of, of spongy, strange land did Norwegian seafarers? <laughs> what were they used to? You know, that's a good question. This seems perfectly fine. I'm standing on a giant calamari. You know, like that's crazy. But then on top of that, it's this idea that they are they are aggressive. They are spiteful they are specifically coming yes. for ships you know there's the leviathan right they're here to exactly. they're here to extract you know deadly revenge or toll on on humans exactly now now here's the thing with with the giant squid one question that always gets brought up with these things is well why couldn't it grow that big mm-hmm. right we haven't mm-hmm. explored the whole ocean yet why couldn't something grow to be that size right and and people always do ask then well you know, in prehistoric times, um, dinosaurs were ginormous. Mm-hmm. Look at the brontosaurus. Look at the, um, you know, we had we had these these animals that were huge that, uh, you know, that lived somehow. Yep. Right. But even those animals were limited by um, were limited by what is naturally allowed for them. Right. Yeah. So the difference between the atmospheres even today versus prehistoric times necessity that animals get smaller now yep. right so um there's less there's less co2 in the air mm-hmm. right there's less plant life for them to consume there's less space generally right right but within the sea it gets even more constrained right so you have to think about things like like pressure surface pressure on the body of the animal God, yeah right yeah how big can something get when it's living 3,000 to 1,000 feet down. It's pretty impressive right? that they get that big, actually. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The pressure is so great that it's... They have to be uh, They have to be constructed in such a way that the pressure will not destroy them while at the same time, um, there has to also be a food source, mm-hmm. right? So these things are limited in all of these things, and so it's a reason why giant animals... This is called gigantism, right? So deep-sea gigantism is an example of, like, the giant squid. And what what seems to occur is that in cases where animals are isolated mm-hmm. so that they have no natural predators, they tend to grow larger. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. So, like, the Galapagos tortoise. Ah, that thing's right? huge, yeah. They're isolated, there's loads of food, they can live forever, they're just going to keep growing. There's no benefit to them being small. Right. Yes, yes. But in the ocean, that is only true for a couple of things. (laughs) (sighs) And even then, they have to be in specific niches of ecology, right? Like giant, like whales are feeding on something that like nothing else feeds on. You know what I mean? Just a lot of it. And and that there's a near infinite amount of, right? Um, Squids primarily eat other squid Mm -hmm. and they eat fish. Yes. So it's unlikely that a giant squid, like a kraken-sized squid, Mm -hmm. would have just enough food even to sustain its body mass. (sighs) Bumming me out, man. Bumming me out. I'm sorry, Marie. But here's a quote from Jules Verne to bring you back up, okay? Sweet. Sweet. Okay. Mm -hmm. Quote, With its untold depths, couldn't the sea keep alive such huge specimens of life from another age? This sea that never changes while the land masses undergo almost continuous alteration? Couldn't the heart of the ocean hide the last remaining varieties of these titanic species for whom years are centuries and centuries millennia, end quote? Oh, that's some creepy-ass shit. Yes, it could. Yes, it could. Well, and that's the question, like, if... But that's, that's an interesting point, though, that he makes. Has the ocean stayed static this whole time? I can't. It's as it is not. No. You know no. what I mean? It's gotten warmer. Mm-hmm. The amount of carbon dioxide dissolved into it is different mm-hmm. than it once was. Mm-hmm. The amount of, and consequently, the amount of algae 
right? The 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 currents have probably changed. Mm-hmm. The speed of the ocean might have changed, like the overall flow rate mm-hmm. from area to area. There's all kinds of little changes that have probably happened. And I wonder if it. This is a total noob question, but because it's getting warmer and because basically the squids live where it's cold, if they're surfacing or getting closer to uh, getting closer to the surface, it's because it's heating up and they they don't they can't cope with warm currents. It's the mm, other thing, right? That's very interesting. So it's like we've been seeing them. Uh, it feels like we've been seeing them a lot more, or there's been more of an interest. But we we have our technology for hunting them or for finding them has also improved. So I wonder... Right, I was going to yeah. say, and also the amount of people looking... Has, in, has increased. Has, in, has increased yes. significantly, so it could be a little bit of both. But we still haven't found the, uh, the Colossal, right? The Colossus is still not... Now, that was a point that we brought up last time. Yes. There is a type of squid that's bigger in terms of mass than the giant yes. squid. It's called the Colossal Squid. We have never videotaped... I want to say a colossal no. squid. No. Um, so that is an interesting, or a live one in its habitat for certain we've no. never done. So that is an interesting question that we are going to have to have to hope for in our <laughs> lifetime. Or not, because <laughs> it's going to terrify the shit out of me still. Or not, because it's going to terrify us. So here's another question about the science, because there was, going back, they were... I was reading that there's two competitive schools of thought amongst giant squid experts, which I don't, I'm sure that there's a scientific name for a doctor of giant squid. I don't know what it is, Um, but man. I'm sure they would just be like marine biologists or zoologists of some kind. Yeah. That's really dull though. Anyways, um, (laughs) one idea. Squid king. Squid king. Squid doctor. I'm a squid doctor. Hey there. Dr. Mayhew, squid doctor. Um, (laughs) Squidologist. Um, there we go. The idea was that it, they, they were inactive and they just drifted around dangling their tentacles like fishing hooks. And that's how, and they would just catch whatever came by, right? And that's, and that's how they stay so large then as well. But the, they don't have to expend as much energy. But the other theory, the other theory is they're actually quite active. And more evidence mm. supports that they're active. And they're active predators because they can move pretty quickly, as we've seen. And as right. as uh, as as studies have have reported back, like they can move as and project themselves um, very quickly, which is also terrifying. It's fascinating. Oh. It's pretty. Cr- yeah, it's interesting. I wonder. See, I would just. I mean, again, mm-hmm. I'm not a biologist. Mm-hmm. On, on a knee jerk level, I would think uh, slow living relatively placidly would be the way to go but then i think about other deep sea animals that are huge and they aren't they aren't very they aren't very um mm-hmm. what's the word like i don't want to say lazy they aren't very uh static either right yeah. like the biggest animals seem to move a lot in the ocean yes it's kind of the opposite for on land yes. where the biggest things tend to kind of they'll hang out and wait in water or you know what i mean yes so Quite fascinating. Really good stuff. Still spooky. So, one cool question that always comes up with the giant squid, and with all animals generally, is can it kill me if we got into a fight? (laughs) Now... That's our big question here. That's the big question always, right? We're, But we're... Listen, we haven't moved on from the first roundtable where we talked about bobcats. Yeah. Um, yeah. We have not moved on from then. So the interesting thing is the giant squid, although it's not considered to be... So the thing is with animals that we've never really... Like, the way that you test an animal's strength um, is in the lab, right? Or in a, in a zoo. Like, you would mm-hmm. get some way to test them verifiably. So, for instance, like with with alligators, we have them bite down on a pressure plate, yes. or you know what I mean. So, I there's was some way to you piss it off, right? Yeah. So there's some way, and we can also look at the bodies to get some sense of just the mechanical strength, like 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 how much tensile strength is in the jaw, and then therefore how much biting force could there be. Yes. The problem with the giant squid is any specimens that have wound up on shore are jellyfied and partially digested, and Squid anatomy is also a lot different than normal animal anatomy. Um, they're filled with water. Like, it's it's just a lot harder to get a sense of how strong they are. Mm-hmm. 
So, and you also have to realize too, they're in the ocean, right? So strength is a different thing in the ocean. It, it's anyone that's been in the pool and tried to like lift up something heavy knows you seem a lot stronger in the ocean, right? You seem a lot stronger in your pool. I used to, as a kid, I used to play Superman because it was like you could lift up, right? Like you could lift up like your much heavier older cousins or whatever. And you're like, oh. yeah. So, so here's the thing with the squid. The squid, is, the giant squid is deadly because of its suckers, because of its tentacles, because it can drag you down to the bottom of the ocean. Mm-hmm. But it's not, it's not considered to be a real threat because of its ferocity. It's not that it's going to come up out of the ocean to attack you, right? Mm-hmm. It's not the same way as, as other animals. I mean, not, there's not really that many animals that are, that are ter- you know, animals are territorial, but it's not like, you know, a killer of men, right? Like a hunter of, a hunter of locals. Like, that doesn't really happen. So you're um, saying you're saying they don't they didn't really attack ships. Is that what I'm getting? They probably at? didn't really attack ships. That's at? that's that what I'm trying to say, Marie, in the softest down to this in the softest way possible for you. I still contend Oh yes, yes they do. <laughs> they are the hunter of men. So Ask but any the, grab a pirate and they'll tell you. <laughs> but here's the thing. They are ex- they're extremely interesting and they have a lot of really weird and really deadly um De- I don't want to say powers. That sounds stupid. No, they have deadly. But they have very, very deadly attributes, right? Yes. So one of the most, one of the most interesting p- parts of the squid, and of the giant squid in particular, is its beak. Yes. And so, for those that don't know, the beak of a squid is its is its mouth. Basically, the squid is composed of kind of soft tissue, and then there's a hard beak underneath that soft tissue of the mantle, right? So Mm -hmm. if a squid kind of looks like a vase turned upside down, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Or maybe, no, not turned upside down. That'd be stupid. It looks like, it looks like, you know, it has that that kind of rounded uh, top of the head and then the tentacles come down off of it and then on top you have that little sock thing, right? Yes. At the bottom of the sock, at the bottom of the mantle of the squid, there's where its eyes are and then there is on either side of it and then the beak is sitting in the center where the tentacles kind of come out from. Yes. Now, so giant the squid beaks can collect into its mouth. Right, exactly. Yes. Now, squids primarily hunt other squids or crustaceans or, you know, things that you need a strong a strong mouth to be able to to get into. Or mermaids, yes. Or mermaids. But yes. the question is, well, the question that was plaguing scientists for a time was the squid's body is relatively soft. So how is it possible that it has a strong beak and it's not like tearing into its own flesh? How is it able to use this beak uh, dexterously and hunt and and bite into these strong things without damaging its own flesh? Mm -hmm. And the question stems from the fact that the beak is actually really soft or it's relatively soft at the bottom, closest to the body of the squid, Mm -hmm. but it's extremely hard at the end. Hmm. Okay. So it gets it gets harder the more you go down the length of it. So it has a gradient of strength, huh. and so it it makes it a very interesting material that um, material scientists and engineers look at as a an example of a material that we might want to make something something in the lab that mimics nature. It's called a biomimetic material. Whoa. So it's a really interesting case, but. That's not even the scariest thing about giant squids, Marie. The scariest thing is that maybe they don't take after their other squid cousins. Maybe they take after cuttlefish. What? And then they would be smart as hell. Fuck. Well, first of all, we don't need them being intelligent, because they probably are. On top of everything else, these predators are probably intelligent. Is what my guess is. Is that your guess, Marie? Yeah. You know what? I'll tell you when you were all like, and here's the other thing about, the, here's the really crazy, I'm like, the crazy thing is that we've been talking about giant squids now for about, I don't know, 72 <laughs> hours straight. <laughs> <laughs> the crazy thing will be like, if we find anybody else who is as in love with the giant squid yeah, as you true. and I, That's Dr. true. Cox. That's true. That's very true. But continue. I'm sorry. Okay. It's fine. Cuttlefish. Mm-hmm are fucking amazing, right? Cuttlefish are phenomenally cool. So cuttlefish are extremely intelligent. Mm -hmm. They can take on extremely interesting 
camouflage, and when I say when I say camouflage, not even just camouflage in the sense of like, oh, I'm on a green board, I turn green. They can mimic patterns. They can mimic surface roughness. Oh, I've seen this. Yeah, yeah they're yeah. they're absolutely amazing, right? When I was in when I was in, I took a course called Naturalism, which was on the philosophy, um, the philosophical school of thought, I guess that's called Naturalism, which is. <laughs> trying to trying to basically merge merge science and philosophy together in an interesting way right or in, or in a way that makes sense to to the natural world as we know it and one of the videos we watched was on cuttlefish because of this famous argument in philosophy where you talk about mental representations mm-hmm. so the question is if a frog when a frog hunts a fly it doesn't know the difference between a fly and a brown dot, right, or a black mm-hmm. dot. Okay. okay. So, so the, the, the thought experiment is, what is it that the, the frog's mind is actually conceptualizing when it hunts, right? Mm-hmm. And so there's a difference. So the argument ends up becoming something like, there is a difference of kind between an animal thought and a human thought Right. Where, although human thought, humans can have animal thoughts, animals can't have human thoughts. Yes, because wouldn't you just argue that the frog is just working off of pure instinct? Exactly. Okay. So the, so the, right, but it's like, it's verbalizing that instinct, right? The instinct yes. would be, um, hunt brown dots, hunt black dots, Right. And so the fact that the frog can't conceptualize between the two and can't tell the difference between the two anytime you, you sh- it sees it shows that the frog is not cognizant, is not thinking in the way that humans do. So it's kind of an interesting, like, a test for consciousness as well, right? Yes. And so yes. then that, beco- that becomes a whole big thing in the philosophy of language and how yeah. the mind and language is built together. But anyways, back to squids. Back to squids, the- dude. Yeah. The reason why I'm talking about this was that one of the videos we watched was of a cuttlefish in a lab where they put it on top of different patterns. And one of the patterns was a checkerboard pattern. And it made checkerboards as best it could. Motherfucking cuttlefish, man. It's amazing, right? So and there are other... How does it do... Like, it, Then you're saying it cognizantly has to understand no, what it's well, seeing and represent... And turn it, or that's instinctual on top of everything. No, else? see, but that's but that's the thing, right? There are there are cases where like blind chameleons still change color. Oh, really? Yeah, because it's not a thing about it. I mean, it depends on on what kind of blindness I would imagine, mm-hmm. but it it doesn't have to do with the brain recognizing visual stimulation in like a cognizant way. Do you know what I mean? Right. So then, how does it know that it's a checkerboard? It. Cause because what it has to do with is some some kind of I would I would argue it's something that we can't even put into words, the cognizant mm. they're they're probably not thinking it. Right? It's it's just it's like instinctual. It's it's just- like it's like how do you cause yourself to, to have a heartbeat? Right? That's true. Now don't get me you thinking don't. about it because then I'm gonna be all like <laughs> It's like you, right? You don't, and so I. Like you, so I. If want, you think about breathing too much, then all of a sudden you're like, "Oh shit!" Okay, I know sorry. it's fucking horrible. Listen, podcasts are the worst thing for that because now I'm always like, "How loud do I breathe?" <laughs> right? Like I'm on the bus and I sound like the kid from Hey Arnold, where I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> right? I'm like, no. Oh! So, and yeah. Anyway, so it's a really interesting question, and the thing is, like, cuttlefish seem to be so intelligent. They Cuttlefish will break out of their enclosures to, like, open up. Uh, like, mm-hmm. there was a story. I, I should have checked the, the veracity of this before I came on the air. I didn't. So if this is not true, I'm sorry, listeners. I will make a full disclosure of its veracity next time if it's not true. Um, basically, what the story was, it, uh, it was a in a lab. They had a cuttlefish. And next to the cuttlefish was a tank full of crabs mm-hmm. that it was it was being fed mm-hmm. to get it to do like things, right? Mm-hmm. Like they were training it, they were whatever. And so uh, the, training it is the wrong word. Um, I don't think they have that level of stuff, but basically like 
they were putting the crabs into situations where the cuttlefish had to open up a, uh, a trap or a or a puzzle. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And the cuttlefish came out of its enclosure and broke into the crab enclosure because it was just open tanks. Right. Right. And so when they came in in the morning, the enclosure was was gone. Like all the crabs were gone. <laughs> And there was one very happy, chubby cuttlefish yeah. just sitting there like, I don't know what happened, man. Like, I wish I could tell you. I wish I spoke English. Someone ate all the crabs. You're going to have to buy more crabs. How did they all left? You better leave this thing open in case I need to defend the crabs. Yeah. Like, you better leave it open. It's like my fucking, my cat, man, uh, Chippy, once... I had my friends, my friends Paul Minkus and Jesse were over in my mm-hmm. apartment. They like, and I, I was in the lab. I had an experiment the day Katie was working, mm-hmm. and so I was like, like they slept over. I think the night before, which is why they were there. And we had decided like they'd stay. I'd get home early and we'd go out for dinner or whatever. And so they were they were hanging out in my apartment playing video games, and my cat kept bothering them for food. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. And they like didn't know what to do, and so we used to keep her food on a on a table in like uh, in like a cereal container. Uh huh. And so after hours of trying to get them to feed her, she just tipped over the container there and ate all of the food. <laughs> oh, I have the craziest <laughs> story. Okay, first of all, it is like Chippy. Sorry, that is okay. it, but that is exactly like. Okay, go. Sorry, I got so excited because I remember because this happened last night. So we just moved. And the place that we moved to has well water, so it's hard water. Okay. So it's not really, it doesn't taste bad, but it doesn't taste great. So Paul and I have, and our family have been drinking out of um, sort of store-bought, big store-bought purified water. Sure. But we've been giving the cat in her own little, she's got this little, you know, self-running thing where we fill it up and then it bubbles down when she drinks out of it. And she loves, she loves the water and she loves playing with it. So she was crying and I, I went and I was like, what, you want more water? Because she's running around her water and she's, t- she's clearly wanting something, you know, fresh water. So I give her yeah. the water. She is, she immediately goes over and starts purring and butting up against the heart, the the purified water container. (laughs) So that is my, I was like, what are you doing? And I'm like, no. And I kept putting her back. I'm like, no, Sofa. We call her Sofa because she's big. (laughs) Her name's Sophie. But Sofa Licious, you you have water, you know, here. And she's like, nope. She kept going back to it. So it's like, so I'm thinking I'm crazy. And again, I am giving my cat over almost superhuman attributes (laughs) of rationale and logic. But her and Chippy, man, first of all, they'd eat all the food. Yeah. Then they'd demand fresh water. And then we'd have to take them to the vet because they would have gotten in and eaten something else. (laughs) That's awesome. Cats. Cats. Yes, we're a cat podcast now. Totally a cat podcast. All right. Good stuff. What were we talking about? (laughs) Giant squids attacking (laughs) ships, I think. I think that's what we were talking about. Okay, but I will say, I do, there is one other story, but I think kind of, it doesn't contradict that they, they don't, that they're not strong and they don't attack people, but um, I know that uh, Scott went into it a little bit on the podcast about the Humboldt squids yeah. attacking a diver, which is fairly recently, and a group of Humboldt squids, oh, by the way, I found out what a group of squids is called. <laughs> what Are is you it? Ready? Okay, I'm so, so ready. It was, it was a shoal of squids, but they felt that that was demeaning for whatever reason. So it's called a squad. A what? squad of a, a squad, squad of, squids. of squids. And now I came up with the idea of calling it a hustle of squids, which is really pretty close. Wait, are you are you lying? I am not lying. <laughs> Look at that shit now. Google it. It is called a squad of squids. A squad of squids. Squad goals. Yep. Why would they pick squad? That's so dumb. It is dumb. I don't, but I don't understand what the derogatory aspect of shoal, which is S H O A L, shoal of of squids. I don't know. Oh wait, 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 wait. wait. This was on change.org. Did they actually do this? Um. Yes, yes, yeah. Well, maybe it's in there. They were talking about it, and I was like, (laughs) "Oh yay! Look at that! It's called a squad. (laughs) Squid squad." So this is a change.org mm-hmm, petition. Mm-hmm. The scientific community changed the name of a group of squids to squad. Yeah. It has 80 supporters, Marie. <laughs> X, 
<laughs> well, it's got eighty one now. Actually, I'm gonna. I wanna... <laughs> I want to write in, and I want to. I want to have them change it from a shoal to a hustle, because I think a hustle of squids has got a lot more. I don't know, it's a lot more flair. We could get. They could probably get better funding that way. Wait, 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 wait. wait. Hmm. But don't you think it'd be better? If, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. So a group of squids are called shoals still. Shoals. Okay. But people think that shoals of squid is a bad name. Well, and squad is is better. I don't know. This is so funny. <laughs> oh boy, good times. I love it. I love That's it. That's good stuff. That's good stuff. I'm now tempted just to call it a squad. Just you know what, it, baby? I'm gonna call it a squad too. We'll call it I a can't squad. believe it. Oh my god. All right. Oh, uh, that's the quality research that you can come to expect from Mad Science <laughs> Podcast listen, Roundtable. I'll read listen. the first two le- two uh, sentences and be like, "Squad, what? Listen, awesome! We double, Roll we double with check. it. We double check here, Marie. We double check on we air, double which check. is it, it makes oh it more exciting god. for you guys. Okay, so a, should this uh, go with the blooper reel? <laughs> So a squad of humble squids, which are also known as devil, right? Devil fish. Yes. The devil fish. He's still checking me here. Stay with me, man. Stay with me. It's only going to get crazier. And they can get pretty big. They can get to be, they're classified. They can be classified as a giant squid. So a diver was diving. I can't remember where exactly, but he was diving. He was found himself surrounded by a squad of uh, a number of squid and they attacked him. One of them dislocated, latched onto him and dislocated his shoulder. Yeah. So I think what it is, is they actually have a ramming speed, is what it sounds like, that they were actually physically running into the, him at top speed to disorient him. And then would one, and someone else would latch, someone else, another squid would latch onto him and would bite as well. Because he, yeah, he so- ended up with some bite injuries and he rightfully so freaked the fuck out because so, so they can swim by a bunch of sw- uh, bunch of, by a squad so let me just say this they they swim at up to 24 kilometers per hour or 15 miles per hour shit and they can weigh to 50 kilograms so around 100 pounds so although they're smaller than giant squids they are still pretty big like they still get to be like 10 feet in length i think it's the biggest yeah. that's ever been recorded so that's not that's st- that's like still pretty ginormous considering yeah. it's the size of a man. A hundred, imagine a hundred pound object hitting you at, at fifteen miles Full per force. hour. That's yeah. It's gonna and take you. It's gonna daze you at least. You know what I mean? It's, it's gonna crazy. freak you the fuck out, especially as yeah. there's quite a few of you, and now you're injured and it's messing with your dive equipment and so forth. Fortunately, yeah. I think he he scared them off. But like uh, as as Scott Philbrook said, what a bunch of punks. They're like thugs. <laughs> damn right? squads of squids. Damn squads of squids this, down there. Ruining this damn. It was a nice mall. neighborhood. It I was don't a know. Nice, it, this was a nice neighborhood until so we got that the, squad that moved in down the street. <laughs> that squad. The inter- they're all wearing leather jackets and yeah, singing doo-wop and da, whatnot. Da, 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 da. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. The the thing with the thing with squid aggression is like I mean again like with most animals. We often misplace or mistake, let me say, curiosity for friendliness, Mm -hmm. and then their aggressive response for being like, that animal's a jerk or whatever. Like, the number of, the number of YouTube videos Katie and I have watched where someone stupidly is like, like, they're in a foreign country, and they're wearing a backpack, and they're like, they got a GoPro on their head, and they're like, look at this monkey I'm about to feed. And then the monkey fucking bites them, and they're like, I can't believe that monkey did that. And it's like, why? Why can't you believe it? It's a, it's a wild animal. It's a wild animal. Well, you wouldn't, yeah. you wouldn't walk up to a bunch of lions, either, and no. be like, oh, well, I don't have anything to worry about. It's just a bunch of lions. I mean, Shit, you, sh- you shouldn't. This. You shouldn't walk up to a fucking raccoon and, and be like, what's up, friend? Like, they're adorable. They're very cute. Trash banners are the best. But they're wild animals. Like, don't be an idiot. You know what I mean? No. I'll have to, someday I'll have to tell you the story about my dad versus the raccoon. Oh, jeez. I'm excited. That one was good. Yeah. He Don't worry about him having any uh, any affinity for... Well, let's for, hear it. We gotta hear it now. Oh, my God. All right. So, you know, the quick... So, my father, who is a... Uh, who lives in Colorado, lives... Uh, in a, a two-story house, 
and it has one of those old um, attics that you have the pull down drawer or the pull yeah. down, you know, so that you pull it down and the stairs come down on top of it. And it's sort of this, it was built in the 1800s, it's sort of a creepy house. So warm summer night. He wakes up, and he's, I think at this point when this happened, he's in his mid-60s. So he's, he's not a young man, but he, he keeps thinking that he is. He keeps thinking that he's, you know, can take well, on stuff. 60 is the new 30 or whatever they say. Yeah. So then <laughs> he hears something up in, the, up in the attic. And so, of course, he gets his flashlight, and he opens it, and the stairs come down, bump, bump. And then at the bottom of that stairwell, it's on the second story, is... The stairs going down to the first floor and again it's an old house and so they're wooden stairs and it's a very steep grade I want to say it's like steeper than you know steeper than 45 degrees it's very like oh, wow yeah I, even when I was growing up I was always really scared of it because it's it is like if you misstep yeah it's, it is almost like it's sort of perilous but again you know 1800s all wood so he pulls it down, he goes up, he's looking around, he shines the light, and then out of, you know, out of the darkness comes um, Mama Raccoon, or a raccoon, and it's like huge, and it's like, <laughs> and so my dad, my father, of course, screams, falls down the stairs, and then no. falls down the other flight of stairs, oh and then my he's God. so fucking pissed off that he gets up. He doesn't even know if he's hurt, right? He he doesn't even know if he's hurt, but he, he, um, he had, he had, uh, softball practice that day so he grabs his baseball bat goes oh outside grabs some janky old ladder that they had rusting in the backyard for god only knows how many winters sets it up and this is like i want to say at three in the morning okay like goes <laughs> up onto the roof finds the hole and is like swearing and belligerently trying to batter this raccoon who then takes off across our roof my father in pursuit on our fucking roof at this point. Oh, man. So, in case you're wondering where I get my stunning intellect. <laughs> your, your flair for Here. the dangerous. Yes. So, he's chasing this goddamn raccoon that, you know, again, it's not a small animal, like you said. They're not. Oh, they're big. They're, yeah, they're big. Pretty big. Yeah. It's pissed um, because it was trying to make a nice warm home, you know, in our in our attic and it, so my dad chases it all the way down into the neighbor's yard and so it's like and then like because I, I was eye chatting him with the next day hearing about this I'm like you stupid old coot like what the hell are you doing <laughs> shit for brains I'm like are you hurt and he's like ah god damn me I don't I, I don't know I'm fine just back here and I'm like and he's like I might hurt my elbow and I'm like can I see your elbow and he's like not my time and then he holds up his elbow, and I kid you not, it's the most disgusting thing I've ever seen. His elbow <laughs> is swollen to the size of a football. Oh like it has, it's holding water. It's completely, it's like almost black. Oh, and I'm like, no. I'm like, you're an idiot. You need to go to the doctor. I, you know, I have to go, I put some ice on it. God damn it. I don't need you worrying about me. I need to get up and fix the attic. And I'm like, oh, seriously. You need so, to go to a hospital. <laughs> yeah. So, uh,. So, needless to say, my dad has a little side story there, but my, uh, Jack Mayhew has no affinity for the, um, for the raccoons, because they, <laughs> they threw him down a couple of flights of stairs. <laughs> They've crossed him. They crossed nice. him, man. They're on the list. They're on the list. So, yeah. Check. Raccoons. Good stuff. Yeah. yeah All right. You know, like All I right. said, that's where I get the, uh, that's where I get the, uh, the stunning, even temperament and uh, intellect that you see before you. So I am re I'm so impressed with the contest entries that we've gotten. Oh man. So so impressed. They're they're freaking amazing. I mean really. We they're actually freaking scary is what they're they are. a little scary. We actually have it's something a scary. We actually have something really it's exciting. A lot scary. We have something really exciting <laughs> to mention here on the air as well. Kristaps from the Eastern Border has mm. been kind enough to Offer to help add to the swag of our contest winners. Shut up. So if you win one of our contests, you will also get a little bit of swag from the eastern border. Hmm. Which is pretty what, like amazing. Some, some uh, bootleg vodka? He's promised <laughs> He's promised various gulags accessories. Hmm. G- gulags. Well, I just completely destroyed that plural, whatever. Hmm. It's fine. No, like stuff like uh, like Soviet era pins and stuff. He was saying he's got some really cool oh. stuff. Yeah, which would be pretty, pretty fucking awesome. I might pretend like I've won. Um, 
so that's really cool. They don't offer us any of that stuff. And and Kristaps has also actually sent in an amazing submission to mm. this week's contest mm. from mm. the distant future of the glorious mm. Soviet spacemen that we will be playing at the end of this segment on the contest. So please give it a listen. Kristaps does the Eastern Border. He's also really, really helpful and awesome just generally to other podcasters. He's a big part of Dark Myths, um, the Dark Myths Collective, along with Marie and myself and our show mm-hmm. and a lot of other really phenomenal shows. So go check that out. And and yes. uh, Chris Dobbs, The Eastern Border. Great show. Great guy. Great friend. Kicking ass. Good stuff. Good stuff. All right. Good stuff, comrade. So. Comrade Christoph. So. People. Da. This is phenomenal. Go ahead. Oh, and actually, quickly before we finish this, Kristaps also got us in contact with a uh, really cool guy who we will be working with to make a science trivia game that we will have for sale after it's been produced uh, in a little bit, but it's going to have all the mad science stuff, all the mad science logos, everything. It's going to look pretty damn good on a coffee table if I, if I do suspect it myself. So if you'd be interested mm-hmm. in if you would be interested in something like that, please send us a message. I don't really know how ordering them will go, like if we have to order them in bulk or if we just have them delivered right away. But Christmas will be here before you know it. It's Hanukkah. true. It's true. All Hanukkah, the all, the good, up, all the good ones, Saturnalia, the solstices. So yes. if you're interested in something like that, please let us know. Um, and you know, we have all kinds of other stuff available too, t shirts, uh, mugs. All kinds of stuff with our logos. Good news stickers. Stickers. We got some awesome stickers. stickers. All right. Anyways. Okay. okay. Enough of that plugging shit, Marie. Enough merch talk. Let's get to intro. Intro. Jesus. Let's get to contest winners. I'm looking at our notes here. This is ridiculous. <sighs> Let's get to contest winners, Marie. Yes. Let me yes. redo this segment, actually. Hold it. Not this segment. That one sentence. Okay. Okay. Oh, God. Wait. Do I have to stop? No, Should no. I you stop? don't have to stop. You don't okay. have to stop. I'm not stopping. Okay. Enough of that logo, crazy merchandise crap, Marie. Time for a space contest. Let's get into it. All right. So this month, we were so impressed with the entries that we had to pick three winners. Yes. The three winners have already been notified and gave us their permission to read their entries here on the air, which is really, really awesome. They had their packages sent out. So hopefully some of you have been able to see the packages and the doodles and stuff that we sent them. Um, I'm going to have to try to think of other cute animals to draw for the next entry winners on their things for their doodles. So we have three winners this month. Our winners are Elizabeth Smith, Joel Welch, and James Garrison. So congratulations, you guys. You fucking did it. It's awesome. You've officially scared Marie and I. Yeah, man. That if we ever oh, finish, Hal Burton is going to be getting a hold of you guys. If we ever, if we ever stop making this show, it's very obvious to us that a space laser will come for us. So, <sighs> yeah. Let's let's start. So we're going to read off their entries and we're going to talk about what we liked about each one. So here's Elizabeth's yes. entry to the contest. I have an ever hopeful belief in the United Federation of Planets, so my weapon is primarily defensive. I call it the subphone wave. A long-held theory is that sound doesn't propagate in the vacuum of space. Actually, high-frequency, short-wavelength sounds can't travel in space. Low-frequency, long-wavelengths can pass in the void. This is where my weapon comes in. Below 20 Hz is inaudible to the human ear. It can, however, cause physical effects. Exposure to this low frequency can cause vertical nystigmas... Marie <laughs> just looked at me like you said that word wrong. Can no, cause no, 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 no. Ver- I'm, I'm just... I- I think I'm just like, she's just so, she sounds like, I don't want to hurt anybody. I'm just saying this is for defense. (laughs) And then you read down, keep reading, keep going. Exposure to this low frequency can cause vertical nystigmus, which affects equilibrium. Uh It also creates nausea and a sense of panic. If we add to this holographic images of our security Mm -hmm. team on our on-screen communications, we can heighten the fear response. Thus, we are perceived as terrifying while maintaining the prime directive. Now, still still peace, love, and understanding here, right? We're still all good. So long right? as that's part of the prime directive. Now, if deterrence yeah, don't work, good. at 140 <laughs> decibels, pain begins. There deeper, you go. deeper and longer exposure can cause lung rupture and tissue damage. 
Thus, the subphone wave can be a more active weapon. Thus ends my entry into the first round winky face emoji. Keep having fun, Keep Elizabeth. Keep having fun, Elizabeth. <laughs> now, what I like about now, this one... if the one, turrets don't work, then the pain right, begins. Right. What, I, what I really like about this one is um, the idea of utilizing something like so that is that is definitely mm-hmm. true right we think of space as being this place without any sound but actually waves can propagate through space now a sound wave is a pressure wave ultimately yes right it's the movement of particles and so in space if there's vacuum in some areas there is no particles but there are parts of space where there are not there are not perfect emptiness right there's right. there's dust there's random gas clouds there's all kinds of things right so Mm -hmm. it's this idea of utilizing sound in this way is is definitely a possibility in some areas Mm -hmm. and the thing is too that this one is really scary because it's something we're actually trying to do on earth right now so the the you know various police forces around the country are already working with using Mm -hmm. non-lethal deterrents to like control crowd size and disperse big groups of people that are rioting and things like that. And so what the idea is, is utilizing the the fear response, basically, that occurs at these lower frequencies to just mm-hmm. make you feel so uncomfortable or so, so nauseous, so panicky that you just mm-hmm. get out of town. You just get out of there, right? You're, you're not, you're done. Right. You're done, whatever, um, whatever it is you're doing. Now right. you disperse. You disperse. You don't now stay in that place. It's yeah. a little scary to think that governments would be using this kind of technology, frankly. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. um, but it's a real thing, so it's pretty crazy. And it is non-lethal, right? It is non-lethal, but it's non-lethal. Pretty pretty nuts. Pretty nuts. Mm-hmm. All right, the next entry is from James Garrison, and James is part of the Oklahoma Skeptic Society. Just wanted to give them a plug. Um, Shout out Oklahoma. Good stuff. Shout out Oklahoma. All right, so this is James' entry. If we're talking about ships that use standard projectile weapons, the first thing you need to have is heavy shielding, possibly as much as two meters thick. Some form of nuclear reactor to supply the energy for not just life support, but also engine thrust and weapon launch and control. Because there is basically no friction or air resistance in space, reactor to supply the energy for not just life support, but also engine thrust. Nope, nope, gotta redo this one. I read mm-hmm. that, you know how many fucking times I've done that since, like, the second grade, it's... Marie, where I read one sentence over? Read the same line? I do the same thing, because I, I can't, yep. Yeah. Okay. If, I'm squinting at this, too. Okay. If we're Go talking ahead. about ships that use standard projectile weapons, the first thing you need to have is heavy shielding, possibly as much as two meters thick. Some form of nuclear reactor to supply the energy for not just life support, but also engine thrust, weapon launch, and control. Because there is basically no friction or air resistance in space, the shape of the vessel is actually moot. It just needs to be able to hold a crew, life support, engines, and weapons. But for aesthetic purposes, I imagine that the ship would be the shape of a similar aircraft carrier today. There needs to be directional thrusters for fine control, as well as evasive Hmm. maneuvers, and they would need to be strategically placed fore and aft, front and back, port and starboard, left and right, and top and bottom. Nice use of ship terminology. (laughs) As well, the main engines would need to be able to pivot slightly to help with directional steering, because the standard... Now, this is a word I had never seen before. Ailerons wouldn't work in the vacuum of space. And that means the directional pieces on a plane's wing. Mm-hmm. For mm. weapons, I'm going to steal from one of my favorite anime, Outlaw Star. And so you've got to have a grappling arm. A drill attached to a flexible tunnel for boarding derelict or enemy craft. For long distance fighting, a rail gun to launch depleted uranium slugs, as well as laser guided torpedoes. Mines to be deployed as a deterrent, and metallic flak to confuse other laser or razor gui- radar guided weapons. If we're talking about having energy weapons, then of course you need to have deflector and energy shields. You well, can, naturally. You can have an ion <laughs> scoop to help recharge the shields as you travel through the vastness of space. Of course, having physical shielding would still be advantageous as a backup. In terms of appearance, I see the sort of ship as a sort of an organic flowing shape, sort of like the Mon Calamari ships from Return of the Jedi. If we're this advanced, then we would probably have some sort of matter-antimatter reaction engines for the power plant. 
As for weapons, of course, you'd want tracker beams, lasers, or phasers, energy Ooh. torpedoes, and some sort of slug thrower, like a railgun, to finish off an enemy once their shields are down, or if you're having to fire on something with a highly reflective surface. You don't want your lasers coming back at you. If we've, and this is my favorite part. If we've mm -hmm. developed transporters, then they can be used as a weapon to materialize an explosive into the middle of the enemy ship or fleet. That's genius. Now, like, why didn't why didn't they ever do that on track? Didn't they do that in that movie? The movie. Oh, what is this movie I mean, like, called? Not the speed, not the Star Trek movie. Oh my God, Galaxy Quest! Didn't they do that in, in Galaxy Quest? They probably did it in they Galaxy transported, Quest because that was like I think they transported like a giant monster onto the alien ship. Yes, they did. You know, and that is an excellent movie. It's a by fucking the way. awesome movie. That is a good movie. It's a great movie. This one, I I absolutely love this one. I love the idea of the grappling arm. That is a great yeah. idea. That is never like okay it's in that anime but like it's i feel like that's a very underutilized space weapon didn't they have that didn't the the reavers have that in uh, firefly maybe i haven't I think watched they had the, grappling I haven't hooks. Watched or they had the drills they had something like they had something somewhat similar it's a that. great yeah. idea and then the yeah. the idea of as well i like i like that he gave two options he gave one of like the laser future and then the kind of like a wild wild west style like 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 very steampunk, much so steampunk hit them with shooting rail yeah, guns yeah. and slugs this is a great I love one that. this is a great one and now for the final winner from Joel Welch Joel said I have no formal scientific training so please forgive me if I use terms like thingajig and that thing and I am fairly certain the ideas below contains dubious scientific concepts Excellent. I would ask Neil deGrasse Tyson, but he never gets back to me. I know your pain, Joel. Well, it's the restraining order. Idea number one, defensive weapon systems. Some modern-day tanks and armored vehicles use explosive reactive armor as a defensive protection system. This involves small metal or ceramic plates sandwiched between explosive substances that, when hit by an anti-tank missile, redirects or stops the kinetic penetration of the tank, thereby saving the lives of the crew. I understand this is probably a bad idea for use on aircraft because, you know, gravity within Earth's atmosphere, but would something like that work in space on a starfighter? An idea, too, for an offensive weapon system, develop a self-replicated spider web goo that can be shot at enemy spacecraft. So from my understanding from watching The Expanse and reading the James S.A. Corey books, space is a big place and matter like spacecraft and projectiles go really, really fast. And when a spacecraft is destroyed, it creates thousands of pieces of debris which themselves become their own little missiles. So the idea is that the spiderweb goo would be shot from a projector with a very small mass, but would expand through self-replicating to the required size to encompass the enemy target. That would not only knock the enemy spacecraft out from the engagement, but would keep it from shattering into thousands of debris pieces. And the goo would be really soft, thereby lessening the force of the impact. <sighs> Oh, really, sucks. really creative. The first off for the defensive weapon system, the the armor plating with explosives in between, that mm -hmm. is is a really interesting idea. I have not seen that discussed for even like terrestrial things. I'm sure they do mm -hmm. use it. Um, he, he actually included some links, so they do use it on on uh, on tank armor and stuff. Uh, and the idea is mm -hmm. that if a thing is coming in at with like a hundred newtons of energy, right, to hit your, mm -hmm. um, to hit your, a hundred newtons of force, rather, to hit your surface, if you can redirect a hundred newtons out back towards it, or even deflect the force so that it's going across a bigger surface area, then mm -hmm. you'll lessen the impact, right? It's kind of the same idea of when you fall on the ground and then you roll to not take the full damage from the fall. I'm with you. Right? Okay. Yep. Yep. Now, the, the, the only problem I see with that, not a problem necessarily, the, the idea that I would think would be similar to that, but a little bit more feasible, would be having a, a polymer composite or a, like a, 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 an ionic liquid, some kind of sheer thickening liquid that when it gets hit by a force, it stiffens to absorb the force and use that force in the liquid itself to make some physical change like a change of viscosity. So a sheer 
a sheer thickening, mm -hmm. a sheer thickening fluid. This is getting to fluid dynamics. Sheer thickening means when you apply a force to a fluid, it gets thicker. Mm -hmm. And sheer thinning is the opposite. When you apply a force, it it becomes thinner. It starts to flow. Right. So an example of sheer thickening would be something like oobleck, right? Cornstarch mm -hmm. in water, um, where then when you hit it, it, it changes, right? And it's non-Newtonian mm -hmm. because it doesn't have a constant viscosity. That's what that's what's non-Newtonian means. Mm -hmm. Sheer thinning would be things like peanut butter or toothpaste, where it's a solid when there's no force on it. But once you hit a certain amount of force, it starts to spread or flow like a fluid does. Dig it. Okay. I think they did something like this with... Um with shock waves on uh, MythBusters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So because it, it's yeah. it's 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 thought of as a potential um, a potential use for things like earthquake protection or yeah. like gunshots. Like, can you shoot through Ublack, Right. Yes. So and it's like quicksand is the uh, basic like the common <sighs> so science fiction. -y cool. Thing. Now for the offensive weapon system, I fucking mm -hmm. love the Spider-Man goo idea. Oh God, that's yeah. awesome. That's so so creative. Yeah. Now, the. Big question for me is this idea of it being low mass to start with. You can't just get mass from nowhere, right? Mm -hmm. So if you shoot 100 kilograms of goo out of your ship, the most your giant ball of debris could contain in terms of goo is 100 kilograms, right? Because you're not getting mm -hmm. goo from anywhere else. Right, it's not growing. Right, so there's two options yeah. here. You could create a something like a, a reactive goo that when it mm -hmm. takes in metallic debris, takes in that mass and helps it to grow, Ooh. right? So this is like a mm -hmm. polymer, this would be like a polymer chain reaction where it's using the, the metal from the ship's hull that it destroyed to keep growing and self-replicating. Or Ooh. you could use a material where it's the same mass, but its volume changes with a chemical reaction. Oh. Right? But again, yes. you can only get so much mass, you can only get so much volume, but it's a super interesting idea, I think. I think we should put all of these things together and just go conquer space. Just make a super duper spaceship. Oh, oh my god. This is pretty phenomenal. So Joel... These were awesome. Joel, James, and, Mar and, and Elizabeth, thank you, you so much. Rule. Thank you so much. Me and Marie are so yes. happy you entered the contest. We're so excited to do another another contest this yeah. time around, it's going to be great. So we're really looking forward to your entries into this month's Be a Mad Scientist contest. Um, and we're, we're just super excited to see them. Yes. Good stuff, and people. You just, you just keep scaring us, man. Keep scaring us, please. <laughs> I would like to thank all of you for joining us and listening in as Dr. Chris Cogswell and I raps nostalgic about one of our favorite topics in science and otherwise. That's the giant squid. Email us if you have another good plural besides squad <laughs> or hustle or, you know, shoal, because that's so demeaning to our to our uh, to one of our favorite animals. Listen, and, Marie. Uh, yeah. Dozens of people agreed with that. Dozens. Dozens. <laughs> it was up to 80, my it was friend. Up to 80. 80. Hey, anytime you can get 80 Americans to agree on one thing, fire the fuck. Pretty up. pretty amazing. We would <laughs> Anyways, like yes, yes, we would like to thank you all for joining our contest, for listening to our show, for messaging us on Twitter and Facebook, and for supporting us in any way that you do. Thank you so so much. Thank you. And we will be back in one week with a episode on mental health myths, which I'm super excited about, bum, bum, which will be bum. kind of a primer or a taste test for our true crime, The Mad Scientist Presents. Mad Scientist Presents! Uh, and we will be back in two weeks with another roundtable, so it's going to be really good. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye!